Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, chatty, chatty Cathy's. Welcome to Eagle Bend Community Church. We'll start off with the announcements by Miss Betty. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I thought we were going to have sunshine this morning, so I'll just smile. <laughs> no visitors this morning, but welcome, everyone. We're so happy to see you. We do have a birthday, Pat Cox. Her birthday is the 8th. So let's sing happy birthday to Pat. And welcome back, Pat and Larry. Really appreciate you guys being home again. Let's sing happy birthday. You notice I walk away from the microphone when I start singing? Because you don't want to hear that. <laughs> so, anyway, Helping Hands is tomorrow morning. We're going to be meeting at Kathy Bounds' home. We have these wonderful, oh my gosh, these fabulous projects that we're doing that we're going to be selling at the craft fair. They are so beautiful. I mean, one lady is making something, and there were nine of us that want to order one. Because she said, how many should I make? And I, we said, well, about ten. And then it's like, wait a minute, nine of us want one. So, so we're going to make about 20. They're, at, they're oh, stunning, stunning, stunning. So um, I'd like to, uh, Pastor Chip, right here in front, I'd like to give you a little background on him if you did not read your email. It said, um, Chip is the father of three boys and the husband of Deborah, a Denver seminary professor. He held several pastoral positions, youth, a planter, and lead in California and Colorado churches. His love of preaching and scripture led Chip to get a doctorate in applied theology. Besides ministry, he also worked for a decade at two of the largest companies in the U.S. He enjoys reading, traveling, old cars, and spending time with his family. So thank you so much, um, Pastor Chip, for being here this morning. We so appreciate it. And Daryl and Barb, as you know, are, are moving. They're, they're wanting to be in their residence by June 1. So on the 26th, which is the last Sunday of the month, which is Memorial Day, Memorial Weekend, we're going to have, no, we, yeah, and um, we're going to have a going away party for them and make a certificate for them, you know, framed, framed certificate. And, um, and I'm going to invite um, the chorale that, uh, that he used to sing in. And I'm also going to invite the players and have them come at 11 o'clock and just to say, you know, goodbye and hello. We don't know how many people are going to be coming because many of them have moved away and many of them have passed away as well. So we'll, we're just going to play it by ear and we'll, we'll have something in the back and, and you know, just keep that in mind. But I'll let everybody know. Does anybody have anything? Okay. You know, I always ask. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Or it's a prelude. Good morning, y'all. Um, so I, I just got back from New Orleans, and I saw a lot of brass bands. So here we go.
Thank you, Calvin. Good morning. We're, welcome to Eagle Bend Community Church. And welcome, Pastor Chip. Glad that you could join us today. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come together and worship you and in freedom. As you be with this service, bless it to our hearts and open our minds to what you have for us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is As the Deer. Let's start on the second verse. Sorry. There it is. Yeah. heads in prayer. Father, this morning you call us together as a congregation to worship you. Thank you for the incredible privilege we have each week of gathering as one in your holy presence. Thank you that each Sunday you speak words of life to us and we respond in praise, gratitude, and obedience. Let us be renewed in Christ this morning and every day as we worship you, 
that we may live our lives that pleases you in every way and that the light of Christ may shine ever more brightly in each of us. Father, there may be some here this morning who have doubts, others with guilt. Some are wondering why they are not making greater progress in their faith. We admit that this world is a broken place. None of us are what we hope to be. All of us far short of, our, of your glory. We confess that the world's greatest problem is not out there, but in here, in our hearts. We ask for your loving hands to be upon all who are on our prayer requests and for those we speak to you who are in our heart. We pray for Pastor Chip this morning, work in and through him, speaking straight into our hearts with nothing less than the convicting, motivating, and life-transforming power of your Holy Spirit. Help all of us. Father, to be not only hearers of your word, but doers as well and help us to think of ways and words by which we can show our appreciation and encouragement to all who do so much to enable our congregation to engage you in worship. We pray all of these things in your name, and we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, th this is a very interesting scripture this morning because it really reflects our ministry here at Heritage Eagle Bend. It was 2004 when we moved here. We weren't supposed to be able to get a mortgage, but we did because we had just lost our, our company, and uh, which was in telecommunications. So we moved here and we paid uh, a huge mortgage of 22%. In those days, it was really bad. But God kept us through. And then a couple of ladies in HEV had a newsletter, and they sent it out saying, we need to have a church. So Betty said, Bruce, look at this. And I said, OK. So we saw the church. It was amazing. So the, this Genesis 12, 1 to 9, about Abraham, his name was Abram when he started, and then God expanded his name to Abraham. It's Genesis 12, 1 to 9. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make you your name great. And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And... All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram, so Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. I was 67 when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his, ne his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to the land of Cana, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morach at Sechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham, Abram and said, to your offspring I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to, to him. From there he went on to the hills of east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west end and the west end and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued to the Negev. This is the word of the Lord. Our next hymn is I'd Rather, I Decided to Follow I Jesus. I'd, I'd Rather Have Jesus. I'd Rather Have Jesus. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, it started with I have decided, so. <laughs> the doxology. desks at home and pay our bills. When we come to that section of the expenses that include the offering to the church, let us be joyful and happy that we are able to support the work of, of the Lord in this community, in this state, in this nation, and in, the, in this world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Song for Spring. Well, it is a, a joy to be here with you this morning. I am always fascinated how the church in Denver seems to work. Uh, I have not heard of your community here. I have lived here for 15 years. And, uh, but a friend of mine said, hey, um, there's this church that meets out at the end of Arapahoe Road and they need somebody to preach. Would you be willing to do that? I can connect you with Miss Betty and so it was great, and I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And so it is, it's a joy and an honor to be here with you this morning to see uh, a community of people who um, have come together to worship, who um, in this season of life, you, you haven't retired from your faith, and that is still something that is vital and important to you. And so uh, that's a beautiful thing to see. So I'm, I'm thankful to be here this morning and to share scripture with you this morning and to uh, take a look at a story that is meaningful to Pastor Bruce. And um, if you're not familiar with it, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into it a little bit. Um, I've heard it said that if you don't know where you're going, it's kind of hard to get there. And sometimes that's the point. Uh, because sometimes there's something to learn in the journey that is more important than arriving at a particular destination. When I had just graduated from college, I had my first job. I was the operations manager for a delivery company. And uh, we were a medical delivery company. And so we would take uh, blood samples and other um, 
specimens back and forth to different labs all throughout Southern California. Uh, nothing cool like body parts or organs, none of that kind of stuff, or maybe even kind of gross stuff like that. But um, we were a small company. We had about seven to 10 different drivers. And at times we had to hire new drivers. And we would, uh, back in the day before widespread use of the internet and ZipRecruiter or Indeed.com, these staffing websites, we would actually place a wanted ad in the newspaper. Um, maybe you remember doing something like that. I'm old enough to remember doing that kind of a thing. And we, we had a, a little bit of an interesting way that we would place our ads. We would not list the phone number to call us. We would only put an address because this wasn't a trick. Um, we thought that if somebody had to call us about a job to be a delivery driver, then maybe they would have a hard time navigating the 50,000 miles of Los Angeles County, San Diego County, Orange County. We thought if they couldn't find their way to us, how would they then find their way to one of our clients? And so we just listed a phone number and then if they showed up, um, we, we, we were like, great, fantastic. We usually hired them right on the spot because they were competent enough to get to us. And then um, we didn't leave them hanging. If you remember also, we used to give out Thomas guides, big spiral bound maps that you would unfold and long before the days of GPS and all that kind of fun stuff. And so uh, I'm sure that we've all been lost, right? In one way or another, we've, we've all not known where we were going or how to get someplace we wanted to be. The irony of be, me being an, an operations manager way back in the day for a delivery company is I have a lousy sense of direction. I get lost. I get turned around all the time. Like I said, I've lived here in Denver for 15 years, and I still have to ask Siri on my iPhone how to get out of downtown. Because I get turned around. I'm like, Siri, just take me home. And then she gets me going, and I end up figuring out where, where we're going here and stuff like that. And so... Um, and so it's kind of hard to uh, know where you're going, right? If One, if you don't know where you are or if you don't know where you want to be. Now, maybe, maybe you're not like me. Maybe you have a great sense of direction, uh, good as a compass. You can get around town all the time and it's not a big deal for you. Maybe for you, you are like me and that you need to end up getting some help to get around. And there are times when there, we end up, though, um, that we're not just lost in a physical sense. Whether that's how, how you've been out on a hike, whether that's you're turned turn around in a new town, whether that's you're, you're trying to get someplace that you've never been before. But we all kind of have this idea of, of feeling lost and not knowing where we want to go. And it's not about um, not wanting to get there. We just might not know where the destination is. We just might not know how we want to go about getting there. We feel that we are lost for a lack of a destination. We're not quite sure what's going on. And sometimes maybe this is, uh, we feel this emotionally. Sometimes we feel it maybe in our relationships, not just physically. Maybe we feel it in, in the work that we do. We're kind of like not sure, what are we doing? Where are we going? Those kinds of things. We feel as we are adrift in a boat without a sail, a way to get from here to there. We, it's not that we're unwilling to move, not that we're unwilling to go. We just don't know where we want to go. We don't know what to do or how to get there. So we just sit still. We don't do much. And sometimes this lostness even affects us spiritually. We feel a little bit spiritually lost or alone or isolated. Wondering, okay, God, where, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? Where are we going? What are you up to? Or maybe it's like, God, when are you going to show up? to move us alone. God, how do I get out of here to where you want me to be? Maybe you're waiting around to be rescued in some way, delivered from some situation or circumstance. Uh, maybe you find yourself stuck in a pattern of choices and relationships and friends and finances uh, that you seem to be making the same mistakes over and over again. Maybe you don't know that you're drifting, that you're in that boat without a sail. Maybe you don't know that you're just going in circles because sometimes movement feels like progress, even though that's not always the case. And so the question I want to ask this morning 
And this applies to me too. This comes out of a, a place where I'm at in my own life and my own spirituality, where I'm in a transition and I'm asking God, what's next? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I want to ask the question of when we feel this kind of spiritual instability, this uncertainty or insecurity, what do we do? What do we do when we feel that way? So if you have your Bibles, uh, open them up. Whether it's a, a, an old-fashioned Bible, you turn the pages. Maybe you're a little bit more tech-savvy and you have a, the Bible app on your phone. You can open it up. And again, we're going to be in Genesis uh, chapter 12 here, hanging out a little bit. And as you're making your way there, let me set a little bit of the context for you. Let me give us a little bit of the flow of the story, if you will, before we get to Abram. Genesis 1 and 2, God creates everything, right? Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve uh, sin against God and they're evicted from the Garden of Eden. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, you have the whole uh, Cain and Abel thing, that whole mess where Cain kills his brother Abel. And then the next five chapters, 5 through 10, are about Noah and the ark. And he gets all his furry friends on his sailboat and they go and they see a rainbow. And then it all ends with Noah getting drunk off of his own wine. <laughs> Chapter 11, we see uh, humanity gets the bright idea. Let's go up and meet God, right? So they build a tower of Babel and God confuses languages. And then in chapter 12, we come across Abram. Now, at this point in God's story, there really isn't a people of God, right? God is just starting out. How, am I, how are we going to save people? How are we going to redeem people? How are we going to forgive their sin and bring them back? So this is very early on. And at this point, there are no Jews. There are no Hebrews. There are no Israelites. As a matter of fact, Abram is, is a Chaldean. And if you read through more of the story of Scripture, um, Abram comes from the land of Babylon. And the people of Babylon end up being a civilization that ends up, uh, they're the enemies of God further on into the story. And so as a Chaldean, Abram um, worshipped different gods. He had different religious practices than Adam and Eve and Noah. There was a whole different culture. And yet here in chapter 12, God speaks to Abram. God has a conversation with Abram. They develop a relationship. It's a significant, beautiful relationship relationship. Genesis chapter 12 kind of unpacks for us that first conversation between Abram and Yahweh, a God that he doesn't know, he's not familiar with, but he's open to understanding more about. So I, if you'll indulge me, I'll just read it again this morning. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will uh, make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And so Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for the land of Haran, and his wife Sarai, and his nephew Lot, and all of his possessions that he had accumulated, and the people that he had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At the time of the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So Abram, he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from, from there he went to the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an offer to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord, and Abraham set out and continued to the Negev, which is down in the southern part of what we would call Israel today. Did you catch here that God told Abraham to go somewhere, but didn't give him a destination? Didn't give him a map? Didn't give him any sort of directions on where to go? Abraham was to leave his current situation, listening to a God he didn't know, to go to a land that he had never been to before. He was going to be disconnected from everything. He was going to be isolated and unstable. He was going to be unanchored. He was going to be unattached. Listen to the things that God asks Abram to give up. Leave your country. So there's a sense of identity there that Abram's losing. Leave your people, your culture. Leave that all behind. Leave your family, 
your connections and go someplace you don't know where I'm going to lead you. That's a big ask. That's a huge ask. How many of us would, would move out of Colorado, move out of the United States, leave behind our, our, our values, our culture, our friends, our family, to go live somewhere else? Probably not a lot of us. But Abraham listened, and he ended up being a nomad for the rest of his life. However, in exchange for listening to God... God promised Abram several different things. God was going to make Abram's family tree, his family line, his descendants into a large, great nation. If you know the rest of the story of Abram and how he became Abraham and Sarai became Sarah, you know that this is a sensitive topic for them. Kids and not having kids. Abram himself would become well-respected, God said. He would become wealthy and important and rich and respected. He would be a blessing and he would be blessed. All the families of the earth would be blessed through Abram. And that God was going to give Abram some unknown land that he hadn't been to yet. But Abram uh, didn't know where he was going to go. No map, no GPS, no Siri to give him any kind of directions at all. Again, how many of us would leave the U.S., our culture, our friends, our family, the things that we're used to, the food that we love, the sports teams that we enjoy, to go to some unknown destination? Probably even less of us would do that. You see, I don't go anywhere without looking things up. I looked up three or four times how to get here. Right? I don't even go to meet somebody at a coffee shop for the first time that I've never been to without looking things up. Because I do. I get lost and I get turned around. But God trusted Abraham enough to say, okay, I don't know you really well. But there's something compelling about you telling me to go to an unknown destination. And I'm going to go. And so Abraham, there's an immediacy in his obedience to God. That Abraham quickly gets just enough time to get all the details together, to hit the road, make the arrangements, and then we're off. He wasn't procrastinating. He wasn't dawdling. He wasn't like, well, let me think about it, right? He's not one of those kind of persons that says, yeah, we're going to move. We're going to do this. And then it takes three or four years to get everything together and then to actually go somewhere. God said go. And Abraham, in his basic, uncomplicated faith, says, okay, God, let's go. We read in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Hebrews 11, 8. Abram was in a hurry to listen and obey God. For him, for Abram, uh, faith was trusting and obeying. That was much more important than the destination. God said, go. Abraham said, I'll go. Even though he didn't know where he was going. That wasn't important. We don't read about Abraham asking for directions. Or we don't uh, see him wanting to know about the whole journey. He didn't even know what was ahead of him. We don't see him protesting and telling God, look, I've got other plans. I've got other things that are more important. Abraham obeyed just the minimal instructions God gave him. Gather up and leave. I wish my faith was that strong to listen to God so clearly and in such a simple, basic way. And when we talk about faith, we mean the trust and the belief and the devotion that Abraham had in God, uh, that his faith aligned with his belief. His behavior matched his belief in what he was doing. There was this perfect alignment that matched up together. He was willing to act on the belief that God was going to keep his promises that God was going to be faithful to him. Because remember, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to have this land. Your family is going to be huge. Uh, you're going to be blessed and be a blessing. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. Many times we read in scripture here uh, about Abraham's faith and his obedience. A little bit further in Abraham's story in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul in the New Testament in Romans 4 says, 
What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. James says the same thing. It says scripture was fulfilled, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. How incredible is that kind of relationship? To be called the friend of God. Because Abraham's behavior was displayed, it displayed his belief that he was right with God. And this isn't the only part of the story, right? We see that Abraham is not only faithful to God, but God is faithful to Abram as well. And this is the beauty of having the whole story of Abraham from start to finish, right? We get to see this if we read on further. Abram's story, we see God's faithfulness. And when we talk about, we say that God was faithful to Abram, we don't mean that the same kind of faith that Abraham had towards God. You see, because when Abraham believed, he trusted in God. He believed God could do what he says. However, God doesn't have anybody to believe in or to trust in or to place his faith in other than himself. There is nothing greater for God to trust in. When we say that God is faithful to Abraham, we mean that, that God is true to his own character, to his nature, that he acts in behaves in a way that is consistent and reliable with who he is. God is fully integrated, if you will, united in what he says and what he does. He's not disintegrated, saying one thing and doing something else. He is true to his source, his nature, his being, his character. Let me give you a couple examples that may make things clearer or they may make things more confusing. If you take a picture of a car or a tree or a person, it's a faithful representation of that person if they match up and the picture looks like the person, right? If a news story is faithful to the facts, it reports what actually happened. If you listen to a recorded song, it is faithful if it matches the live performance of the song. So God is faithful to and in himself. He's perfectly and without compromise able to portray and keep his word and his promises. And he can't be any other way. God can't be unfaithful. God can't not not be God. He can't deny or act against his nature. Unlike you and I, we can pretend, we can confuse people, we can lie, we can misrepresent ourselves, but God doesn't do that. Not in any way. We see God's faithfulness to Abram as he fulfills his promises. Abram is called the father of Israel because from him, his sons, Abraham, right? Isaac, Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. And then from there, we begin to have this people group, the Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites, and they grow out. Uh, and they, by the time of the Exodus, when they're in captivity in Egypt, their numbers grow from this small family, just Abraham and his wife, to maybe, possibly, with all the children, two million people. Abram becomes famous. He becomes wealthy. We're talking about him today. All these years later, if we keep reading the story of Abraham in, in Genesis, uh, we see that Abraham grew powerful. He ended up uh, fighting battles. He ended up taking captives, collecting the spoils of war. Genesis chapter 13 says that Abraham had so much gold and silver and cattle and livestock that this actually caused problems for him. Life wasn't all cupcakes and kittens because of this blessing, right? We talk about Abram today, thousands of years later. And if you're familiar with uh, some of the Jewish religion and some of the uh, religion of Islam, Abraham is important in both of those religions as well. All the people of the world are blessed by Abraham. He was a blessing to all people because if we read the genealogies of Jesus and in Matthew and Luke, we see that Abram shows up in those genealogies. And Jesus is the, the greatest blessing that we could ever have. That in Christ, we get to experience God's grace and mercy and his forgiveness. I can't think of any blessing that would be greater than having that forgiveness in my life. No amount of happiness, no amount of wealth, no amount of free time or sunny days or great sporting events can equal that kind of 
blessing in my life, in your life. And it all comes through Abraham. He's part of that family tree of Jesus that shows up in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. Eventually, the people of God, the Israelites, make their way to their forever home. We know that they get out of slavery in Egypt, and what should have been an 11-day journey turns into a 40-year wandering trip. But eventually they make it to the land of Canaan, Israel, what is called the promised land, because it was promised to Abram by God. God keeps his promises. All in all, God is faithful to Abraham because Abram is faithful to God. And here's the crazy part of the story. Abram was faithful, trusting God, going where God led, even though he never saw all the promises come true. Without seeing the complete faithfulness of God, Abraham was devoted and faithful to God. Twice in the New Testament, we see that it's said that Abraham dies without seeing all of the, pro uh, the, pro the promises of God. He only saw them from a distance, but that didn't worry him. That didn't stir up doubt in his life or distrust. It didn't cause him to disobey. We read in, in, in the words of Paul in Romans 8 again, against all hope when it seemed impossible, Abraham believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to them, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. And yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised to do. The destination, the directions, the map wasn't important for Abraham in this time of spiritual instability and uncertainty, in this sense of instability, he was faithful. So what do we do in a situation like this? When, when maybe we're, 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 we're doubting God or we're feeling alone or isolated or we're waiting to be rescued or given directions about what's next, when, when our life is uncertain and we're not sure what to do, where to go. You see, if you think about it currently in our country, in our neighborhoods, in our families, there's a lot of uncertainty. The world is an unstable place right now. And we have questions that don't seem to have answers. We have problems that don't seem to have solutions. Uh, we have heartbreaks that don't seem to have hope. And this gives us all kinds of reasons to feel insecure, to feel like we're in that boat without a sail, just adrift. It makes us wonder about the power and the ability of God to rule and to reign in our world. All of the things that we see that go on in the news and in our lives, the lives of our friends and our family, these can all cause us to doubt the character of God, uh, to doubt the goodness of God when we see injustice and war and abuse and murder and poverty and hunger. We feel an unrest, a lack of peace. We see our cities degrading and our countries destroying each other. This can make us long for heaven, long for a place that, that we can go to and get away from this, to check out of society and just let it burn to the ground. However, what do we do when we feel this way? When we feel hopeless, unsure, wondering what God is up to? Well, Abram is a great example. He trusted God, not knowing the outcome, not knowing the ending. And again, it wasn't all roses. There was problems in there. There was issues in there. But Abram's belief in God was in alignment with his behavior. We act and behave in alignment with God when we believe, when we trust that he will do and keep his promises, that he will be true to himself and true to us. Uh, that he won't leave us in a place of uncertainty 
where we are outside the scope of his power and his ability. Uh, we are in alignment with his character and his will. And, and when we continue to pray when we don't want to, uh, when we worship, when we feel like doing something else, when we dig into scripture to understand the character of God, when we don't understand things, uh, our behavior proves and displays our belief when we lean into a community of people to know them and be known by them. We keep leaning into those practices. We keep being faithful. Isn't that the definition of faithful? Continuing to do something over and over again. Uh, when maybe we don't know why, maybe we don't know what it'll produce. We're not quite sure where it will lead us. During the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about the uncertainties of life when things are unclear and unstable and uncertain. He talked about the need for food and clothes and a healthy body. And the antidote to all of these worries about the things that we face, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and then everything else will take care of itself. In other words, don't let what you see cause you to doubt what you believe. Don't let the uncertainty of life, family life, work life, financial life, church life, distort and twist your spiritual life. Focus on being faithful, not the final destination. Don't worry about next week. Worry about right now. How am I being faithful to God? Because if I am being faithful to God, that gives me the belief that God is going to be faithful to me as well. Abraham believed in the faithfulness of God when he didn't understand it, when he didn't know where it was going to lead him, when it seemed like it was very slow in coming about, when it looked like things were going in the wrong direction, when things were going sideways and coming, the train was coming off the tracks and life looked like a dumpster fire. But this wasn't an excuse for Abraham to lose faith or chuck it all. You see, part of the complications of Abraham's story in entrusting God that really can reflect our stories is that sometimes we get to the promised land. Sometimes we get to the place where we think God is leading us and that promise isn't quite ready yet. If we keep reading past Genesis chapter 9, excuse me, uh, chapter 12, verse 9, right? Abraham goes to the southern part, right? He gets to the promised land. He got where God was leading him. He ended up in the destination. God says, I'm going to give you this land. This land is going to be yours. And then we get to verse 10. Verse 10 says this. Now there was a famine in the land. There was a problem in the land that God was leading Abram to. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there because the famine was severe. Abraham got to the place that God was leading him and then had to leave because the promise wasn't ready yet. But Abraham was still faithful, even though it was a change of plans, even though it was a new direction, even though it was a new destination, he didn't fall into unbelief. He didn't chuck it all. He didn't give up on God. He was faithful to God because he knew that God would be faithful to him. Let me leave you with a word of promise from God, a bit of encouragement for your faith, no matter what you might be facing. Again, if you're expecting a rescue or deliverance from some situation, some circumstance, maybe you feel like you don't know what's next for you and you're just sitting still. Again, you feel that maybe you're moving forward because moving in a circle feels like motion in progress when it really isn't. Let me offer you this, the words of Paul, to a group of Christians in the city of Ephesus that were facing persecution, unstable times, who were feeling vulnerable because of their faith. He says this, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Praise be to God's glory. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. The Spirit of God that lives in the life of the believer is a guarantee, a deposit of God keeping his promises. God has given to each Christ follower his spirit as a down payment 
of his love. There is nothing that we can do to gain more of God's love. We have it all. God has promised to never leave us, to never forsake us, to never abandon us. And as proof of that, even in the most unsettled times, when we feel lost and nervous about the future, when we don't know what it holds, we have the Spirit of God through Christ that lives in us, guides us, loves us, and works in our lives. Let us pray. Father God, as we face an uncertain future, uh, maybe in our personal lives, maybe in our corporate church lives, uh, maybe in our cities, our state, our country, we don't know what's coming. We don't know the destination that you are leading us to. Father God, let the Spirit of God reassure us of your love and your generosity. Father, that those who have placed their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins would have that down payment, that guarantee of the Spirit of God working in our lives, that we might be faithful, trusting, devoted people, and that we will continue in our behavior that displays our belief in who you are. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship this morning, to be together, to find encouragement in your word of your love and your grace and your mercy to us. In your name we pray. Amen. It's my understanding it's a tradition to read the Apostles' Creed. And it'll be up, I hear it's up on the screen. So will you join with me as we read this together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He preached to the dead, the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. In preparation for communion, let's sing Sweet Hour of Prayer.
Our Lord Jesus Christ gave us direction. A week before he was crucified, he met with his, 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 his disciples in the upper room. He said, I have direction for you, my body and my blood. Here is my body, take and eat in remembrance of me. And after they finished eating the bread, he took the wine and said, this is my blood shed for you. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. Let us pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Closing him is, I have decided to follow Jesus.
trust him gives us good, good direction to follow Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord bless, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Have a great week.